everyone. We are now going to be looking at one aspect of C which is used in order to in some sense expand the capabilities of what the regular compiler can do. And this is something called the preprocessor. And as we will see, this is also it also plays a crucial role in how we can sort of organize our projects. Basically what happens is that when a program that you are trying to create or a problem that you are trying to solve becomes sufficiently large, having all your code in one place in one file becomes unwieldy, it becomes difficult to manage. So instead we would like to split it up across multiple files, each of which is organized in some logical manner by grouping together functions that are related to each other. And how do we sort of compile and uh, put together executables from systems that are built in this way? That's the question that we are going to be looking at in the multi-file projects part. But first we are going to look at the preprocessor. So the outline of this uh, session is going to be something like this. We'll first look at the concept or the idea behind macro expansion and talk about what that has to do with preprocessing and how the C programming language uses the idea of preprocessing in order to implement functionality that may not be easy to do with just the basic language itself. Uh, in particular, there are a couple of specific, they are not really keywords, they are not part of the language as such, but they are part of how the, uh, and they are in fact processed by something that happens before the actual C compiler kicks in. And two of the words are very common, one of them is called define and the other is include both of which you are very likely to come across in even fairly simple C uh, programs. And an associated concept is that of using header files, which we will also be talking about. And in some sense, this leads naturally into the idea of a multi-file project, because that's primarily where you need to use header files. And we will also talk briefly about how compilation and linking of files works, and what you can sort of expect to see when you are trying to break up the compilation process into stages. So the first part of what we are going to be talking about over here is a concept that is usually referred to as a macro. Now macros exist in many programming languages. In the context of C, they are implemented using something called the preprocessor. In other programming languages, they could be implemented in a completely different way. In particular, languages that are in the Lisp family have some very interesting properties where a large part of their functionality in fact comes about through the use of macros. Right? And macros are used in order to create new ways of writing code uh, that would not normally have been possible in other circumstances or rather would have been difficult to do. What you need to keep in mind is that technically all programming languages are more or less equivalent to each other, meaning that anything you can do in one language could also have been achieved in another language. The primary difference between languages comes about in how easy it is to do something and what are the sort of features or facilities that it provides you in order to do certain things. Now from that point of view, by now you would have understood that C is particularly good when you want to have fine-grained control over your memory access uh, what happens with the different data types that you have, where things go in different locations in memory, and even the constructs such as for loops and so on are so simple that they translate pretty much directly into something that you can almost visualize is going to be there in the assembly language. Right? Other languages try to increase this level of abstraction. In And in general, the trade-off is that by increasing the level of abstraction, you find that there are more powerful ways or cleverer ways by which you can express certain kinds of functionality. The sort of penalty for that very often is that you are no longer as close to the hardware as you would like to be and therefore you take a hit in the performance or the speed with which the program runs. In a lot of cases that's actually a good trade-off because programmer productivity and the ability to write code quickly is very often more important than how fast a program runs. So you often find that in a given program there are some parts of it that really need to be optimized and run fast, whereas there are many other portions which you really don't care if they run fast. So there could be parts where you know you are perfectly okay if they are written in a higher level language that is easier to write and debug but tends to run a little bit slower. That of course is partly the explanation for the popularity of a language like Python 
right, which is very easy to read and understand at a basic level. It has serious performance issues when you compare it to a language like C. On the other hand, the authors of Python as well as various other languages have done a very good job of allowing Python to integrate with libraries that are written in other languages. Now, those are some topics that we will be touching upon later at some point. For now, we are interested in how we can in some sense expand the functionality of the C language through the use of what we call macros. So the idea behind a macro is very simple. Effectively what it says is you use a word called define. This actually occurs in your uh, C code itself, right? And it's typically prepended by the hash symbol, right? In some cases, uh, especially in American English, that's sometimes referred to as the pound symbol, right? Uh, but we usually call it the hash symbol. So I'll be referring to as hash define. So when we say hash define and some text, okay, of course, I've highlighted it in green over here. In the real code, it would just be some text. It would be a piece of text. Interestingly, I mean, of course, that piece of text is not allowed to have a space in it. But for now, I have just grouped this together and, you know, said that this is what I'm trying to replace. And what I do is I hash define some text as some other text. And literally what this means is that there is a sort of pre-processing stage that then occurs over here where we directly replace some text with some other text. Okay. In other words, if I have a string somewhere in my file that contains the letters, this file has some text. After I go through the pre-processing stage, that line of text would have altered into this file has some other text it is literally a direct replacement of the text, right? And this is important, which is why I'm emphasizing it. You need to understand that a macro expansion or a text substitution or text expansion, as we are mentioning over here, is not by itself performing a computation. It is not even a set of instructions in the programming language. In fact, hash define has its origins completely outside of C. The actual pre-processing is done by another program which is not part of the C compiler by itself, which is why it's called a preprocessor, right? There are multiple ways by which you could potentially have done this preprocessing. Of course, in the C language, there is a standard way by which it is done. But the net result is that all that you really care about is whenever a piece of text occurs that has been hash defined as something else, the preprocessor is going to replace that with the other thing that it has been defined as. Right. Now, this kind of macro expansion is used at compile time. That is another very important thing to keep in mind. Macro expansion happens only at compile time. Right. What that means is after the compilation phase is over and you have got an executable program, there are no further macros. Everything related to macros has already been processed at this point. There is no concept of text expansion after this unless it is explicitly some kind of a function in your code that does the expansion or you know ma manipulates code in some way, uh, manipulates the data in some way, right? Typically at runtime, it is very unlikely that you are going to modify the code by itself that you are writing. On the other hand, at compile time, macro expansion actually allows you to modify the code that you are writing. We will be seeing examples of this as we proceed, but this idea that macro expansion occurs only at compile time and that it can be used for manipulating the code that you are actually going to run are both very important concepts to keep in mind. So the first keyword, uh, keyword that we have is the define keyword. As I said, you know, the word keyword is probably the wrong term to use because technically this is not even part of the C language, right? It is possible to replace hash define with some other kind of structure or some other set of characters and use a different kind of preprocessor that would have you know, modified the code in a different way. And in principle, that is perfectly fine. That would still be a valid C program. It is also perfectly fine to have a valid C program that does not have a hash define or a hash include at all. Right? Both of these are perfectly acceptable. Right? So the hash define or hash include are not fundamentally parts of the language. They are in some sense optional, but they are so useful that you are likely to come across them pretty much in every single program that you write. So as I said, CPP is the name of a program which we can actually run. And this is the preprocessor. 
it expands macros. What exactly does macro expansion mean? As I mentioned earlier, it takes a piece of text and directly replaces that text with something else. Right? It also does this recursively if needed. And we will once again see what exactly that recursive expansion means by looking at some test cases later. Now, macros are also allowed to have arguments, right? And in particular, a kind of argument would be that you could actually have something which looks like this, hash define abs of x. By the way, one other common convention that you are likely to note when you are coming across C programs is that macros are almost always defined in all caps, right? And this is convention. There's nothing fundamentally telling you that you need to do this. But it's a common and useful convention because it makes it very clear to the person reading the code that this is a macro. It will be substituted out with something else at compile time. And the corresponding implications of what that means right, are things that you actually need to understand clearly when you're using macros. For example, I could write a macro which basically finds the absolute value of a variable. Right? By performing this computation, effectively what it's doing is the ternary comparison operator, right? which basically checks is x less than 0. If so, the question mark case, it returns minus x so that the result becomes positive. And if not, that is x is greater than or equal to 0, it returns x. A couple of things to observe over here, there's no semicolon at the end. This is not an actual statement. right? So by itself, all that will happen is whenever abs of x occurs, it will be replaced with this text exactly as it stands. The only interesting thing over there is x will be replaced by whatever it is that you actually want, th that you actually put in there when you are calling the, uh, this macro. The other thing that you might notice is this looks very much like a function call or a function definition with a couple of differences. It does not say what is the type of x, it does not say what is the type of the return value of the abs macro in this case, right? It's not a function, right? And if you really think about it, what this actually says is, I could call abs with an int, with a float, with double, with pretty much anything that allows me to perform a comparison like this, and it would work, right? Provided that this comparison as well as this negation operation are defined for whatever data type I have. So in some sense, this has allowed me to create a generic function, one which finds the absolute value irrespective of whether the number was an integer, a floating point number, a double precision number, a short value, a character, anything that can be treated as a number basically, right? Or anything that can essentially undergo this comparison as well as this negation operation. That's all that I really care about, okay? So as, is hopefully becoming clear at this point, right? Macros have a lot of potential power behind them. How you use them, of course, you need to be careful. In particular, as again, we'll see with an example, you probably need to put in quite a lot of parentheses in this statement over here in order to make sure that it comes out correctly, right? And an example is that we might have to write code like this. We'll look at an example of this later. You can also have multi-parameter macros where you can essentially say max of just like a function definition, you can use this notation, right? And this is actually something very specific in the sense that whenever it sees parentheses out here, the macro expansion treats whatever is inside the parentheses as a separate word or a string to be substituted. And it handles each of those as comma separated values that need to be uh, substituted individually, right? So this actually makes it possible to define even macros that handle multiple uh, parameters. So as I said, one of the key things that we need to keep in mind over here is the fact that macros look very much like functions. The biggest difference and one that is important to keep in mind is the fact that macros are expanded at compile time, right? Literally, a copy of the code that you write over there is created for each time that the macro is used 
In the case of functions, there is a concept called inline functions, which we have not really paid much attention to so far. The idea of an inline function is that it is used for very small functions. It basically takes the exact text of the function and literally replaces it in the place where you want to use the function. And the idea is that by doing that, you avoid things like you know creating a function stack, passing arguments to the function. Some of those things get simplified a little bit and potentially can lead to faster code. Macros are in at, at some level, you can think of them as similar to inline functions, but they are capable of more. For example, as I told you, you know, you could have a macro which is neutral to the type of argument that you provide to it, right? It will still work. And they have other caveats as well. They have problems potentially. The most important thing is that you can create or generate code that did not exist originally in the language and you can create new ways of writing code that can potentially make your life easier as a programmer. You have to use this with care because if you are not careful, you can rapidly end up creating a new form of the language which is impossible for anyone other than you to understand, which sort of defeats the purpose of using a general purpose language like this. You are probably better off then using some kind of a customized language that works only for you. Another thing that you need to keep in mind is, in general, macros are not the way to go if you want to have reusable code or if you want to share that code across multiple files or multiple uh, libraries in some sense, right? In other words, it does not really help you to create a reusable library. You will find that libraries do use macros, but not directly to write the code itself. And they also have limitations in terms of how they handle recursion. As I told you, they do expand macros recursively, but exactly that, they actually expand the macro in place. And potentially that leads to a compile time problem and you can end up with errors in how it is handled as well.